Thank you. Hi, I'm Max, and I want to tell you a bit about a toy program I, I have been writing since last year, App Shader Toy. But first, a disclaimer. There are lots of pretty pictures and animations in this talk. They have all been programmatically generated, but not by me. Except for this test card, this is how far my creativity goes. So when I'm programming for fun, I like to push the boundaries of Perl a bit. And how better can you push the boundaries of Perl, a text processing language, than by creating real-time graphics? Um, yeah, and I like to do things because I can. So I want to create real-time graphics in Perl, but I am lazy, so my idea is get someone else to do all the work. Or in my case, let OpenGL do all the work. And that's really easy because you send the GLSL program to the graphics card, set up some variables in Perl, and then you get to watch pretty pictures. And yeah, that's nice. This is some GLSL program. It looks mostly like C, and it basically is C, except for some restrictions. And yeah, my toy program takes such a shader and turns it into pretty pictures. It is um, a shader live editor so that I can see if I make changes in my shader program, how they look on screen. I did not come up with this idea myself. It's based on an idea by Inigo Quiles and Paul Jeremias and they run a website, www.shadertoy.com, but my program is written in Perl and not a website. It's based on the Prima toolkit and uses some OpenGL modules. And time permitting, and the gods of demos permitting, there will be a live demo, and indeed the program runs, and it runs my test card shader, but you can get far much more interesting shaders like this soothing set of clouds that slowly moves on, or this weird, I don't know what it is, Beautiful. or even some people have generated a toy train that moves through a landscape, and also this nice, See, and it's even interactive. I can draw with the mouse and look around and see water everywhere. And the live editing works like this. I see my shader on the right, and then I turn off the sky. And then the sky is gone and the desktop shines through the window. So yeah, my plan is to turn this into some desktop ornament. Yeah, what do you need to do to get it? It's not yet on CPAN because it's highly experimental. So you need to get clone the GitHub repository and then install the dependencies and run it. And that's it, thank you. Hi, my name is Lukas Mai, and I have this module called Function Parameters, which some people apparently don't know about, but they should. Uh, what it does, it gives you functions and methods with parameter lists, which are often called subroutine signatures, but I don't like that name because they're not really signatures, they're just parameter lists, like this. And you might be wondering another one because there are like a dozen modules that do this or similar things on CPAN and there are in core signatures now. So some features are it's not a source filter, it does not use devel declare, so it's really solid uh, syntactically, it doesn't break. It's feature rich, it has many features, that, most of them are configurable if you want that. Uh, it provides everything that core signatures do and more. It, it is not experimental. It has been stable for years now, I think. It's written in XS. It requires a C compiler and at least Perl 5.14. But it runs on, yeah, 5.14 stable and upwards. Mm -hmm. And it's somewhat opinionated. It doesn't just implement everything. You have to see if, that, if you like that or not. Perl 6 is opinionated, too. 
that is true, very much. I'm also talking about method signatures and other things, but yes. Um, here's how you use it. You use function parameters, which by the way is a lexical pragma, so it adds new keywords to the current block or file. And there's a fun keyword. You can see here it has three arguments. In this foo function, x, y, and z has a default argument. You call it with two arguments and it uses the default for the third one. Everything also works with method, only method gives you an implicit dollar self variable that is shifted off the argument list for you. Um, you can use dynamic defaults, that is any default argument can refer to uh, parameters that occur earlier in the parameter list and you can also construct references in there and every call gets its own reference unlike say Python where the thing is pre-computed once and then shared across all invocations which sucks. Uh, you can also do this with methods and for example dollar self is in scope so you can call methods on that to prov provide the defaults. Uh, Here's a funny thing, if you write a collection class, say, and it has a values method, and in that same file you also use the built-in values function on a hash, you get a warning, ambiguous call, because Perl thinks, well, you might have wanted to call that sub. Um, if you declare it as a method, you get no warning, because Perl knows, well, this couldn't have been a method call, so it's not ambiguous, it's fine. You can use named arguments, so, or rather named parameters. You can put a colon in the parameter list, and then at the point of call, you use the same syntax as a hash initializer, and it will figure out which value goes where. So in any function that takes more than three arguments, that is really helpful because you don't have re to remember, well, which one was that. It's just automatic. Uh, you can combine this with slurpy parameters, which are, uh, uh, the last parameter can be an array or a hash, and it will just gobble up the remaining arguments. This can be combined with the named parameters. So color x and y go to the named variables and flavor chocolate just goes into the rest hash. Just works. By the way, these are all um, required arguments. You can make them optional the same way you make positional parameters optional by providing a default value. Here's a slightly more unusual example. This uses Moo. You can import modifiers. So you can implement a around method, which in addition to dollar self gives you, gives you an implicit dollar orig for, the, for a reference to the original method that the user was trying to call. You also get uh, before and after and that stuff. And you get types. Function parameters doesn't implement its own type system, it just uses what is in scope. So for example, you can load type standard with all the names there, and you can declare the parameter to be an integer, a string, or a reference to a hash, and more complicated stuff in there. Anything you can build out of that, you can use. It just works. Uh, of course, it also works in methods. And if you don't use type standard, but for example, moose x types, it works exactly the same way. Moose X types moose. It's just there. If you're crazy, you can redefine the way the keywords work. You can provide your own keywords if you want to define functions not with fun or a method. You can say, I want def or proc or an actual Greek lambda. And yeah, this actually works. Uh, you can also configure that to not allow names, so you have to use lambda for anonymous functions. But yeah, most people probably don't do that. There's also introspection. You can ask function parameters various things about the functions it knows. It gives you an object and it has various information in there. And basically, you should take a look at this. Thank you. Okay, um, so I have to say that uh, Mark Keating's uh, mention of deep fried Scottish stuff made me a bit hungry. Um, so um, this is, um, oh good it does work. Um, this is, um, I've been doing Catalyst for a few years and um, I've been doing um, module issues for uh, 40 minutes or so. So I thought it would be, uh, yeah, so I thought it would be good to make a comparison of them, right? Right. Um, yes, blame MST if this talk is wrong. He said it's okay to say this. Um, so first thing you have is routing, um, and on Catalyst you have to declare those uh, functions in your um, controllers, um, and you can 
tell it with local to use the function name you gave it or uh, give it a specific path if you don't want to do that. Um, and you can do more complicated stuff like uh, chaining um, and so on. Um, and in module, you can just define the, those uh, routes in your um, module file. Uh, but um, what I liked is that you can sort of give name param named um, arguments like this, and they're um, very, very easy to use as they are in Catalyst as well. Um, for things like request handling, handling um, get and post parameters, uh, both frameworks are pretty much the, the exact same thing here. Um, templating, uh, you can have your view classes in Catalyst, and uh, I think most people use template toolkit. Uh, it's not a requirement to use it, but um, it has its own um, template toolkit syntax. Um, and Mojo uh, actually has its own template system, and you have this um, weird sort of perlish um, entangled with HTML stuff going on uh, for it. Um, and database stuff, you can have models in Catalyst, and sometimes it's a bit of work. Um, have to sort of make this class and declare um, your model class and configure your database and so on. Um, and you can do this in Mojo, uh, I think a bit simpler. Uh, you can just declare a helper um, and then use it um, with the name of the helper like this. I declared my DB helper, so I use dollar self DB. Um, JSON, now this is, um, this is a bit of a thing that annoyed me in Catalyst. Uh, to, um, to show JSON, it's not that difficult. You just declare your custom view um, and you subclass um, Catalyst view JSON, then forward to it. Um, and to pass JSON, you have to do sort of, if, so if you get JSON in uh, your body, like instead of just having um, normal HTML form style parameters have, say, an Angular app that posts JSON, um, have to do this hack. So in, in Mojo, it's really, really simple. You can use $C uh, rec, rec JSON to do it. Uh, so that, that was something that I thought was very simple and I um, liked about Mojo. And um, last, because testing always comes last, I, I'm kidding. <laughs> last is testing. Um, so we have sort of similar frameworks here. Um, and um, yeah, again, this is the JSON thing. Uh, and Mojo actually does the JSON thing built in, unlike Catalyst, where I just showed the decode, the decode JSON thing in my test. Um, but another cool thing is that you can chain them because they just return dollar self in Mojo, so Catalyst doesn't do that. Uh, and that's it. And um, so thank you, and I will uh, probably upload those slides on that website, or maybe I won't. So thank you. Right, we've managed to get, coerce this uh, HDPI machine to talk 90, uh, 1080p. Right, my name's Dirk Koopman. I've been writing programs since 1973, um, and since about 1994, I've been concerned with writing message systems for a living. And having done that for a few years, um, some friends of mine who are also radio amateurs and in the same general area of work said to me, um, Dirk, um, this thing called a packet cluster, which is on the screen here, um, would you write a new one? Because the current one's written in for DOS. It doesn't work very well. Well, it only works on floppy disks. <laughs> <laughs> and they wanted something a little more modern. And so they came to me. And this is the result. So. Um, this is a little, um, it lies. I started in 1997, not 1998. So this has been running and slowly improving since that time. Now, it was actually my first proper Perl program. And some of it really does show. 
Um, but we've got rid of quite a lot of that. Uh, underneath, it's an IO select single threaded um, switch, um, which has about two years ago been changed to a Mojo Licious, a Mojo IO loop underneath it. Um, the nice part about that, and the reason I did it, was to see whether or not it would make it more efficient. Well, yes, it did, uh, by, a fact, by an order of magnitude. <laughs> so, um, if I can persuade this switcher to work, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I've been struggling with the um, uh, DPI now. This is the canonical site. I thought I'd, rather than show you PowerPoint, I'd show you something actually working. Um, this is real time. This is what's happening right now. Uh, it's very quiet. In the, are there any radio hams here? Any radio amateurs? Has anybody used a DX cluster of the three of you? Do you know what I'm talking about? And a great silence. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> Basically, if I can explain what this is about, um, radio amateurs talk to each other and they have contests to see how many people can talk to as many other people as possible. They have things called QSL cards. A QSL card is a bit like stamp collecting. So there are awards you can get for having as many countries, islands, zones, and a myriad other things. And what you're seeing on the screen there, on the left-hand side, are what are called spots. So in other words, someone has heard that particular station, that's the one on the middle row, so there's one just come up of YB772RI-5, that's a call sign, we're all issued with one. I'm G1TLH, as it happens. Um, that is a special, as it says, a special call. And this is going out on a, using a flood routed protocol. Um, the old, the, uh, one of the problems with the original was that the setting up of nodes was very, very controlled. And the difficulty with that was that if it wasn't a strict tree, with no extra joins, um, it stopped working. This flood routing protocol that I've invented um, basically deals with all of that. Well, I say invented, I've done it before, but this is just a different variety in ASCII. Um, when it gets busy, if I can show you, um, Um, as this is a site which has, can have 200 users, um, and as you can see, the CPU usage is really not very much. Uh, that would have, that even in its current state, would have been up in the around the 12, 15 seconds, uh, sort of uh, percent, uh, seconds per minute of CPU usage. Um, where were we? Sorry. Um, I've lost my thread. I'm sorry about this. Um, completely lost it now. I apologise. Thank you. Thank you all. Hi. My name is Nicola. And, uh, on, you can find me online under the pseudo uh, Atomic. So yes, this is my talk. So this is a B, C, yes, that's a B, C talk. Uh, mainly B, C, this one. I mean, the B, C, it's a B module. And B, B is the backend uh, uh, compiler that ships with Perl that allow you to manipulate Perl internals uh, directly in Perl and access directly to uh, SV object. One of the main function used is for the SV ref to object over CPAN. The one that BC is mainly using is work up tree to work the up tree, and there's also another flavor with debug to freeze the up tree. So short story about BC, it was introduced in 96 by Malcolm Beatty, 
and it was maintained by several people, but right now it's still maintained by Rainy Urban, and you can find it on CPAN. So um, BC comes with her own script named PerCC, but also other uh, compiler, BCC, the bytecode one, it was removed from core with, with 510 because it was unstable and not more maintained. And the last version shipped by default with pair with, was 59.4. Um, in 2015, CPanel decided to fork BC and remove a lot of features on support in order to simplify and improve the maintenance of it. So mainly, we were only focusing on Linux system on the current uh, Perl version we are using at this time. And the idea was uh, every time we're going to switch to a new Perl version, we're going to create a new branch so we don't need to maintain a uh, previous version. The project is only available on GitHub. There's no uh, meta CPAN release or CPAN release. Uh, the main feature you can find are extensive usage of uh, cow strings. Uh, the introduction of BC EV to avoid bloating the binaries with uh, unwanted uh, dependencies. And right now, since the last weeks, we have static GV, static malloc to avoid um, to uh, call malloc for the uh, array on ashes part, and um, many more features that I cannot list there in this talk. So many BC, what happens? You have your program with different stages. This is an extract of um, Brian D. Foy uh, um, web page explaining the different um, blocks. So BC frees your code just after the compilation stage. And there, it's going to generate, um, and yes, what happened at begin, uh, or stay at begin, which means you can spend 10 minutes, 20 minutes compiling your program, you don't care. For example, you don't really need a PP, uh, PPR there. You can use, um, you can use um, PPI without no problem at begin time. If you are going to generate a C code, and then from that C code, you're going to compile it using GCC, and then you can run the binary on your server on, or any other server using the same architecture or having the same modules. So for example, very simple, Perl CC is like Perl, you can use dash E, and it, and, and it will produce a binary by default A dot out that you can run and it will execute it. You can also use the dash R option that will automatically run it for you. But more than this, right now with the 524 version, we can even compile Moose. And if I show you a sample of this, it's very simple, basic Moose program. Uh, you, okay, the only important thing there that it compiles, it just takes 40 seconds to compile, about like less than one minute. But once you have it, uh, you can see that it's linked to some XS modules. Once you have it on the ready, the uncompiled version, if you run it on my, on my laptop there, it's uh, one of the times it will take 20 seconds. If I run the compiled version, it only takes two seconds. So really we divide the runtime by 10 by compiling a binary, and now there is Moose support. So everything is online. You can find the original one on Metasip, on CPAN, uh, and also on GitHub. OK, so I wanted to talk to you uh, about scratching two itches that I had uh, and uh, the result of that. And hopefully, you'll find it interesting. Um, as you know, you can write configuration files in a whole bunch of different formats. Um, but since we're writing Perl, what about Perl? Uh, so you might reach for one of these, and these are, of course, wonderful tools, uh, but they do have an issue. What do you do with untrusted code? You don't necessarily want uh, someone's arbitrary code running on your machine. You might know about this module. Uh, you can limit the opcodes that can be run, but it does require you to know that list of opcodes and how it might change across different versions of Perl. So that didn't really scratch the itch for me. Uh, there are several data undumper modules on CPAN. Again, didn't really scratch that itch. Uh, I kind of felt like doing this, so I used PPI to write config Perl. You give config Perl a file name or a reference to a string, just like PPI, and it parses that into a Perl data structure. So here's just a really simple example, just one variable in this configuration. Um, you give that to config Perl. Uh, it turns that into a hash reference where you access the variable, variable by its full name and uh, you get back the value. Some of the things I support are scalars, uh, arrays, uh, hashes, uh, anonymous arrays, anonymous hashes, the QW operator, uh, really simple variable interpolation. 
Um, and so just for example, in this configuration file, the way you would access uh, that le very last value is uh, with this sort of symbol table kind of like hash reference. Uh, so you access percent data, that's the key. And then the rest of it is just, just like the regular Perl data structure. So that's the first module. Um, now for the second one. This uh, quote is from uh, the one and only, and uh, it is in reference to the module shell, which was actually in the Perl core for quite some time. Uh, it will take unknown function calls and turn them into shell commands. Uh, so this program here will actually run the four programs, echo, cat, ps, and cp. Um, the email does go on to say, uh, that's maybe too gonzo. Uh, maybe the user should specify uh, which functions they want to turn into system commands. So I took this whole thing as an inspiration for the module IPC run three shell. Uh, this is the minimal changes required to make that example uh, work. Um, then modernizing that a little bit gets you this, and uh, it basically does the same thing. It runs the, those four system commands. Uh, turning on warnings also gets you the warning that the copy command didn't actually succeed, unless, of course, you run this as root and then catch good luck. Um, <laughs> That looks very similar, those two examples, but there are differences. First of all, there is no auto-loading going on. Uh, hopefully, that will help keep you sane. Um, the, it gives you optional warnings when there are failures, not like non-zero exit codes, which you can optionally make fatal. Um, Despite the name, it actually does not go through the shell uh, because I'm a bit of a purist there. Uh, I don't like to worry about shell meta characters uh, being passed, uh, and I'd like to be able to pass those to my external commands. Um, but you get the full power of IPC run three for redirection of standard input, output, and error. Um, the functions it generates are context sensitive. So this first example here is sort of like Perl's system. Um, it will uh, not redirect standard input uh, um, and standard output. Um, these second two examples are like Perl's QX. So the first one gets you the full output as one string, and the second one gets you the output split on the input record separator. Um, there are a whole bunch of options, too many to go through here, so here's just one really simple, hopefully self-explanatory example. Um, does what you expect. Uh, yeah, these modules are on the CPAN, they're on GitHub, and thank you very much. Yeah, hi. My name is Daniel Böhmer. I'm a Perl developer from Germany, and I work as a freelancer, and I want to tell you one of the reasons why that is, because I have the freedom to spend my time for things I find worthy. And because uh, uh, before I can tell you all the details, I need your attention of all of you because I want to do a very small survey. Um, I need to know who of you has ever uh, cooked for 100 or even more people. Yeah, I see some hands, that's very cool. Please keep listening, I need you. And maybe there are some of you who know somebody in person or even, or even part of an organization that is cooking for that many people. We've done that, I want to show you. Um, in our church we make a summer camp every year. We go out on this meadow and in the beginning there's nothing, then we build up everything of this. And we need to cook for all these people and there's no real kitchen there. So this is our kitchen, it's actually only a tent and there's an open fireplace uh, in the edge. And there we cook for 150 people every year for three weeks. I find this really hard, and um, how would ordinary people do this? All the planning and the recipes. Of course, they use Microsoft Excel. And then over the last years, they came to me and said, have you, do we have a good hint how to do this in Excel and how to sort all these things and collate them? Yeah, I didn't have any. Perl came to the rescue. We started to do a Perl web application uh, two years ago. Um, it's for collecting all the recipes they have and making good food plans. And I usually use Catalyst and DBSC template, pretty ordinary Perl stuff. And the features that are already working are they can insert recipes they have and it automatically adjusts the ingredients to the number of servings that are planned for this meal. And then you have this purchase list with hundreds of items and you can simplify that by uh, combining things. If you have some kilograms of sugar and some grams of sugar, you can convert the units and get an easier 
projects lists. And in the end, when you're done with all your planning, you can have a nice print view um, with the plans and the recipes and, of course, uh, lists for going shopping. Yeah, what have we done so far? Uh, without me knowing that, they started to plan this year's camp uh, with the program and it actually worked. Uh, we had 19 days and everything was done with the program. Um, and all in all, there were nearly 60 meals. Every meal consists of different dishes or they have diets, so 166 dishes. And in total, there were nearly 6,000 plates served and everything was in, th in time thanks to Pearl. Yeah, um, this, these are the things that we want to do next. Um, currently, only we ourselves use that program and nobody has ever written how to install it. It's not that difficult, but I need to write it down. And I'm not a design guy. It has an ugly UI, basic HTML. We need more automation, more things that happen just automatically. And next year, we want to do the next camp and there will be more people again, uh, over 150 people. I'm looking forward to all feeding them with Pearl. <laughs> and we need more uh, users of that program uh, named Kukuk. Maybe that's you, maybe the ones that raise their hands. Uh, maybe you know other people uh, doing their food plans with Excel. Please tell me, um, make contact. Um, I want to provide the program to people. And yeah, I am planning to do an online demo that you can just click in an existing project and have a look at uh, what it does for you. And once self-registration is working, I want to host uh, Kukuk for anybody just to click an account. Um, yeah, I showed you the photo of our meadow where we are out in nature. We have no laptops with Wi-Fi there. Um, so it's a bit difficult if you want to change something in the end. Uh, I'd really like to have an Android app, but I'm not an Android programmer. Please and get in touch. We have the domain kukuk.org, currently uh, redirecting to GitHub. Uh, talk to me. I'm here until tomorrow and you see my email address in the ACT conference system. Um, I'd like to cook for more people with Kukuk and Pearl, and then please enjoy your meals. Thank you. Uh, part two to yesterday. Yeah, this one, go ahead. Uh, so I still have a pronoun, um, and I want to ask you some question which might become Pearl.40. Yesterday we were aware of one opinion, we want better code, we want tests and better help. Index pages would be nice, consistent input, we also could agree. So we had the first two things, but what I couldn't do in five minutes was a search and a little bit about add-ons. All right. Search um, to pursue you a little bit more is not just for the command line user, but I want also that Perlock will be the central tools to fuel uh, IDEs and other stuff um, to get out the particular information if you make an on mass over action or something else. So we have a central uh, uh, station and a good communication and not uh, fragmented in a lot of tools. All right. Let's start. You all know Perldoc Q Shuffle, also that's from the documentation. That, but this only asks uh, the uh, FAQ about uh, where the shuffle um, is. In the rest uh, documentation, you can't search. I want to change that. I want to put uh, also limit by topics that you say, oh, uh, only in the operators or net ranges of of, of kind of documentation. Who of you would like to see such a feature as a search in the man pages, basically? All right. So, who thinks this is a bad idea? Yeah, probably not. And like I said, I don't want to like make some crazy new stuff. It's just expand what is there. Yep. Um, actually, I had another idea. Big. Um, uh, what do you think? Um, to have an option which gives you just the header of a pod documentation, so you know what chapters are in there. Who, um, who thinks this is a good idea? Um, and who thinks this is a bad idea? Uh, 
All right, uh, because this is this is the first thing what I my brain came up when I thought about uh, what of, um, like tools like ID. I mean, I know a little bit something about writing editors, what they need. If you have some GUI tools and we have a directory um, table of content, and when you click on something, it gives you just one chapter. Yeah, of course. Um, um, if, if you have a search, you, you could also say um, search only in the titles or um, in the text or keywords because there was a flag, key fl a flag for a pod announced some years ago. It never came as a feature and um, I'm still pondering about it. It's one of the more controversial, but it's somewhat accepted in Circle as well because it was accepted, but it just was never implemented, yeah. And it's no one who wrote pot actually used that. Who liked the idea that you can introduce in your your mostly uh, module authors in your module documentation um, such K flags for keywords? What does it offer over X? What is X? Yeah. X, X the X for reference entry. What? What is X? There is already X, which does what you would describe. Oh. I should do my homework. <laughs> All right. Um, and um, a little bit about add-ons. Um, you uh, know, of course, you can um, install some modules um, for other languages, like here for the Italian language. Um, one of the modules I like is Syntax Construct, um, um, which um, tells you when a certain um, feature was introduced and I'm not speaking just of the things that are listed in feature um, in the module pragma feature but more and I think such information is more value uh, is very valuable and what I imagined is that people who writing such good documentation or are just starter um, could install um, such additional uh, documentation and you had the special flag that lists you what such additional documentation is installed on your machine so you don't have to um, search it afterward. Who thinks uh, something like that would be a good idea? Oh, ah, not much. All right, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, all right, uh, so I give it a low priority, uh, but I still um, will do. Okay. Uh. Hello, I'm Daxim from Vienna PM. Jason feed on not, uh, how to not write a specification. Three months ago, two authors published the specification for yet another web feed format. The release happened without any prior expert review, and it shows. In just five minutes, we can identify fortune major problems. <laughs> Number one, its reason for being. The authors state as their goal to supplant XML-based formats, and they contrast JSON feed against XML-based formats, but they are completely unaware of activity streams and collection plus JSON, which are two JSON-based feed formats that are already in use. Number two, it hijacks a generic content type. The specification says application slash JSON should be used, but that's already in use for JSON proper. You cannot programmatically decide between JSON or JSON feed. This means in practice that consumers have to resort to horrible hacks like content sniffing. Number three, gratuitous incompatibility. The authors decided to come up with a completely new words to express existing data types. Uh, for example, the field updated is now called date underscore modified. These changes are uncalled for and no justification is given. Sometimes the semantics are changed in an incompatible fashion. Uh, for example, the title in an Atom feed can be plain text or HTML or XHTML, but in JSON feed it must be plain text. Again, these changes are uncalled for and no justification is given. Altogether, this means that a software that integrates with web feeds, for example, a feed to email gateway, has a much harder time than necessary to, to adopt this specification. Number four. Lack of discovery. JSON feeds are not discoverable. In practice, this means that uh, when I visit the homepage of a blog or something, my web browser indicates that here's a feed I can subscribe to. Or I open my feed reader application, paste the address of a homepage, and the feed reader automatically figures out the exact URI of, of the feed. All of this is common everyday practice with Atom feeds, but with JSON feeds, this is not possible. Number five, insufficient internationalization. You cannot specify the language for individual feed entry or text elements. In practice, this means that some, uh, the text processing software must guess with heuristics, a Greek word that means sometimes wrong. Examples of text processing software are stripping full stop words for full text search, um, text to speech, or hyphenation. 
Number six, lack of modularity. The vocabulary of JSON feed cannot be reused in other JSON documents because the semantics are not backed by a machine-readable description. Number seven, lack of a schema. Atom comes with a relax ng schema. JSON feed does not have any schema. No one can validate the feed for conformance. Number eight, there's no equivalent of Atom pub a publishing protocol. All you can do is read your blog, forum, wiki page through your feed client, but you cannot post to it. Number nine, Rob model for extensibility. Quote from the spec, the extension name must begin with an low line character. You see, this is a namespace problem because the extension name is mostly unregulated, a freeform string. Extension names can easily trample over each other. As we all know, strings have no ownership and the specification authors did not establish a registry. So every, uh, every single other technology on the web partitions the namespace with a URI instead problem solved. Number 10, lack of threading. Feeds for comments on a forum or blog need threading, which means uh, nested replies to each other. This is part of Atom, but JSON feed is unable to model this because the entries are a flat array. Number 11, insufficient support for licensing information. In blogs, it is common to mark your content as, uh, for example, redistributable under Creative Commons. This means that no one needs to ask the content author whether it is legally okay to aggregate the content. Content with copyleft or free licenses can also be automatically picked up by special archives and search engines, for example, Yahoo Search or Google Image Search. This is supported in Atom, but JSON feed, uh, feed does not have it. Number 12, lack of deleted entry. Very often it happens that the block entry is deleted by its author after publication. The deleted entry tells a feed line to invalidate its cached, cached entry. This is part of Atom, but JSON feed does not have it. Number 13, uh, lack of version navigation and revision tracking. Let's skip this. To the last one, they have been trolling you. Quote from the spec, if you are trying to decide which format of RSS, Atom or JSON feed to use, you can, and you can do only one, pick RSS. It's time tested, popular and good. <laughs> now, now think about it, yeah? just think about it. The authors have so little confidence in their brain shade that they recommend the biggest flaming shipwreck of web feed formats over it. Reminder, Atom was specifically created because precisely none of RSS could be salvaged. What can we learn from this? Nothing is so bad that it can't at least serve as a bad example. <laughs> and and, and if, if you want adoption, 100% uh, compatibility is required so that the workflow of users is, are, are preserved and then put extra features on top so that the original thing uh, didn't have to lure them away. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, my name is Henrik. And uh, I'm, my main job is uh, network management. Uh, and um, at work, mainly, our uh, network is relatively big worldwide. We have a few thousand devices. Uh, we have about 10 tools managing these devices in different capacities. I mean, conf configuration management uh, reports and stuff like this. Um, so the um, problem with most of these is there's a few thousand people, just over a thousand people, using these different tools. and. Uh, Obviously, it's very difficult to, to synchronize all that information. So um, some of it was done with CSV, or some really is like manually typing, because not everything has, uh, has the different APIs. So at some point, I fell back to uh, Pro, and one of the modules I wrote for this is called uh, NetCisco ACS, which um, supports uh, Cisco ACS. <laughs> Cisco CS is for, used for uh, uh, auth uh, auth yeah, authentication and authorization for uh, uh, access to network devices. Now, the, the problem with Cisco CS is it's a virtual appliance and runs on top of uh, VMware. The uh, hardware requirements is something like 500 gigs of disk space, so this is not something that you just install on your laptop and develop on. So one of the problems that I had is I can't test it in production. Obviously few thousand network devices. I can't just start adding network uh, devices to it or accounts or per set permissions. Um, so I ended up writing NetCisco ACS mock, which is, in, which is in fact just modulicious, does some REST stuff and XML. Um, I had a similar problem with uh, Cisco IC. There's no specific focus on Cisco, but these are the two products that first came to mind. And uh, I'm using NetCisco IC 
uh, mock. Same type of principle, slightly different uh, API. Um, one of the other tools that I ended up writing, uh, modules ended up writing was uh, it's called NetIntermapper, which interfaces with the product called Intermapper, topology viewer for network devices. And um, it's kind of awkward in a different way because it uses CSV. You just access an HTTP, uh, do an HTTP call, and you get CSV back. And making changes also does, uh, also do with CSV. Um, I did something similar for a product from HP called Network Automation. Um, and um, originally it was actually doing uh, Telnet or SSH calls. So it would connect to a Telnet server or SSH server and um, either do a query and get some real uh, strange SQL art back or do some, uh, make, make some changes. Um, the newer API actually does a partial SOAP implementation. It's still slightly broken, um, but obviously, right? So in the end, I start working uh, on my own time on something called Network Glue, which kind of tries to uh, merge all these things together instead of just using the standard Perl modules and doing some scripts. And um, yeah, this is more or less what it's about. So Perl uh, Network Glue resides on uh, Postgres, it does some TACX for authentication as well, it runs on a Mojo and a Moose, and underlying there's also SOAP, some REST stuff. Radius also for uh, authentication and then DBIX for uh, some database. And this is a screenshot. It's still in very um, alpha, but it does some basic. Uh, sorry? Um, does some basic functionality. It does already uh, allow you to do uh, manual syncing. Um, and there will be some, in this case, it's mostly uh, accounts, but there will be some device uh, synchronization added as well. And obviously, it's still quite unstable, but I'm always happy to uh, accept any input. And it's on, uh, on GitHub as well. That's, that's the domain. Thank you very much. So, the Perl Tool Change Summit. You take 35 developers, you shut them away for four days, you provide food, and snacks, and then bugs are fixed, problems are solved, modules are released, IDs are hatched, information is shared. I missed a slide. <laughs> Help is given. Uh, new plans are formed. Cross languages, challenges are solved. Uh, plans are agreed for the next years and pull requests are, mer are merged. What is the Pro Toolchain Summit? Well, rather, what is the toolchain? Uh, it is for POSE and CPAN clients. It's all of the metadata and uh, specification, uh, the tools, basically all the tools around CPAN. Uh, we are being, you know, version agnostic regarding Perl. We're trying to do Perl 5 and Perl 6 stuff, and that's where some of the collaboration around Pose uh, happens. And yeah, test tools and development tools. So who's, who's invited the people who work on those tools? Uh, it is mostly invitation. And we get all the people who know exactly what they're doing, and we bring them all together so they can have a high bandwidth uh, channel to discuss. Uh, it happens about everywhere in Europe. 70% of the, the people are from Europe. Yeah, I know this is, oh, whatever. Um, and it is mostly, so it is invitation, which means we pay for the travel, accommodation, and food of all the people that we uh, invite, and which means we need sponsors. And this is only this is only possible because of all of our sponsors, and thanks to them. <laughs> and if your company relies on Pearl or relies on the tool chain. Uh, maybe you could sponsor the Pearl Two Chain Summit next year. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, Neil again. <laughs> so you know what happens next for next Wednesday? 
Yeah, it's not my birthday, it's Sipan's birthday. Uh, it's going to be 22. Uh, August the 16th is the day of the first upload to Sipan in 19... What? It's 40 years since Sobi's time, as we can talk the same day. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, 1995. So what can we do to celebrate Sipan Day? Sipan Day, sorry. Uh, we basically celebrate Sipan uh, and contribute. So we can do this by improving on, on our own, or rather you can do this, uh, improving on your own Sipan disks uh, by, you know, all of those things, all of those things and those two. Um, but you can also improve someone else's distribution by doing the same thing, improving documentation tests and so on. And you can also say thank you to the author of your favorite module. Uh, but not just random thank you, like why you like the module. And if you really don't know what to do, Neil made a blog post. Hello. So this will be uh, the full stack in five minutes because someone challenged me to do it. So let's go. So uh, we are going to try and implement this little table of uh, Yapsi, uh, previous Yapsis. Um, and you will notice, for example, the middle row is a slightly darker color. How do we do that? Well, we obviously use the table tag because this is a table and everybody loves tables because it's 1995 still. Um, and the middle table, you'll notice, is class equals even. Um, and the other two rows are class equals odd. How we do that uh, in the CSS file is we just set a different background color. How does it get that get onto our browser, you might ask. Well, that comes over HTTP. Uh, so the browser sends a, a uh, GET request. The uh, response comes back. It notices there's a CSS sheet in there somewhere, honestly. That'll be in the head, which is elided by the dot, dot, dots. Uh, so we fetch the main.css, and we parse that. Now, how does that get onto the uh, network? Well, in our server somewhere, um, in our HTTP server, Somewhere around, we may have this gen table function that generates a table. Um, we call this hypothetical uh, enumerate function. Oh, oops, I forgot to give it a list. Never mind. Um, we iterate over the rows. I forgot to put at dollar rows at the end there. Never mind. Uh, and we look at the index of the row to see is it odd or even. And we use the little percent to uh, mod operator to ask is it odd or even. How does that work, you may ask? Well, uh, how that works internally in the interpreter is that um, this is an op modulo, uh, which takes two arguments, the pad SV, uh, that looks in the pad to find the variable it's working on and the constant IV2. Um, how does that work? I can hear many people ask. Well, in C, um, the, the actual function is about 50 lines long, but it basically boils down to this thing, where we look on the stack for the top two values. We store them in left and right. Uh, we call the percent operator, because it's the same thing in C. Uh, on those two things, we, we get the answer. We set the target to be that answer. How does the percent o operator work? Um, somebody might be given to ask. Well, so in assembly, uh, this is a slightly hypothetical um, CPU. This isn't really an x86 because that's terribly complicated. I've only got about two minutes left. Um, so um, in, in our, in our uh, assembly code, we might fetch the two values off the stack that are R28 plus 8 and R28 plus 12, fetch them into the two registers 12 and 13, uh, call the mod operator on 12 and 13, putting the result back into 12. Um, how does that work? Well, in the machine code, we uh, encode that as saying this is an operation on the multiply and divide unit, uh, because mod is just the remainder after division, so it's a kind of division operation. Um, uh, and we encode the register numbers 12, 12, and 13 uh, into uh, effectively binary numbers. We just pack them all together, and, and that is that ultimate number there that encodes the, the thing. Well, how does the CPU implement that? Okay, so here are our registers, and we have a bunch of registers. Uh, we put the values into the data bus. Um, sorry, we, we, we feed from the registers directly into the um, ALU, the uh, arithmetic and logic unit, or, or in this case, the multiply divide unit. And then the result comes back through the data bus and goes into there. Well, how does all that work? So we have a bunch of logic gates. Um, that implement that. So uh, this is, this is a, a gating system between an actual register. So the actual register values are stored in these little uh, DQ flip-flops here. Uh, we have a write enable line that, that reads the values from the data in bus that, to capture it. And then if we want to read it, we use the uh, little high Z buffer uh, gates at the far end to read the values out so that we can select one register if required. Um, 
How does that work? Well, we have this little uh, arrangement of transistors. Now, this is actually a toy implementation because I drew this uh, with a mouse sat on that table yesterday, and I couldn't be bothered to put in the full implementation. So obviously, I've had to cheat and just use these little current sources up here rather than duplicate the entire structure upside down in a full CMOS implementation. So, so never mind. So don't heckle me, please. It's, it's just a toy, but, but it works. Uh, now, how does that work? Well, every, every individual transistor is a, a section of uh, silicon. So you have an endoped piece of silicon stuck between two Ps. That creates a channel uh, whose uh, channel resistance varies depending on the voltage on the gate, uh, which is all, uh, isolated with a piece of silicon dioxide, hence called a, a MOSFET, which is metal oxide silicon. Uh, how does that work? Well, quantum dynamics. It's, it's actually quite simple. Um, <laughs> So once, once we've done all of that, uh, we just layer all that up, we create the um, semiconductors, uh, we stick them together into transistors that form logic gates um, to uh, implement our machine code uh, that um, executes the assembly that the C code compiler uh, built to implement the optree for the Perl. Um, that generates our table that looks like that. That's been the full stack in way under five minutes. I've been Paul Evans, thank you. Right then, so uh, I'm Tom, I work at Shadowcat, and uh, I'm going to quickly go over a couple of the weird horrors that I, I've come across, and this is going to be a very high-level talk, unlike the last one. Um, obviously, um, names and identifying items have been re uh, removed to protect the guilty, I mean innocent. Um, so, let's start off. First encounter. Now, I'm not so innocent as it is, um, so I'll have a look at one of the things I first created when I started in Perl. Um, this, and uh, let's start a counter... Go on, do the thing. There we go. So, five sand points. Uh, let's start there. So, uh, let's have a look at the personal horror. So, for my first forays into Perl, um, I was trying to build something that pulled out my uh, schedule from my, work, my old workplace. Um, and so, uh, what did I do? Yeah. It worked. It worked. Once. Um, <laughs> so, uh, there we go. First bit. Um, to parsing HTML with regex. Um, lose one sand. Let's go on a bit further. So if this is something that Mark will remember me swearing about a lot recently. Um, what time is it? Um, so, um, time, yeah, what's the difference between a timestamp column and a date time column? <laughs> Timestamps have a time zone, date times don't. Well, that's not too bad, just use UTC everywhere on a date time column, and use ISO 8601 strings, and you can pass the data back and forth and everything's happy, um, but the browsers have different ideas of what 8601 means. Um, JavaScript sometimes just bothers and uses local time, and if you're using some modules, they only run in local time. They ignore the, date, the uh, timestamp, uh, not timestamp, uh, time zone. Um, and sometimes they just completely strip it out and, uh, and ignore it. So, okay, we make sure that everything goes into it in UTC. We do everything back and forth. So we use uh, date time format, strip time. And um, then, obviously, then you've got to... Um, mm, you get it back out, you get your date time object, and then when you want to put it back in the database, um, it, if you're using a date time column, it will ignore the time zone. So you have to then force the time zone to, lo to uh, be UTC and then push it in. Um, and this doesn't actually do, I've found this doesn't actually do the right thing with um, DBIS class in flake column date time. Uh, if you have a time zone set, it doesn't actually deflate back and two from that, it just ignores it, I think. I may be wrong, I'll have a look later. Um, but yeah, using, using time zones, um, yeah, bye bye Sam. <laughs> so, encounter three, something we happen a lot. Client code. Um, yeah, these are a few uh, select uh, statements from my IRC logs, obviously, um, Matt will remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's happened a couple of times. <laughs> What I forgot to mention on that particular line was it was 20,000 lines. I'm sure you've all heard this one. The bandwidth cried. Uh, this was an entire, this is the next three lines. That was Matt's reply. And then I found that everywhere. Um, yeah, we lose two Sam this time. So, next encounter, what are we going to get? Does it work? Actually, it does. Oh, okay, fine, let's have a look. Uh, oh, it's got tests. Do they work? Yeah, they work too. Okay, right, okay. Hmm. And they actually test something. Ooh, right, okay. Um, there's got to be a catch here somewhere. No? Okay, let's look a bit further. Hmm. 
Again, one sanity back. Excellent. So I've got two sand left for this last one. So, encounter five development. Two points left. What have we got? Hmm. Do they have a separate development server? Separate database server for development? A separate environment for development? Oh god, they develop on production! <laughs> ah! You've summoned Cthulhu! You lose! <laughs> How to break your system, Pearl, in two easy steps. Developers hate him. Here's my various contact stuff. Not that's going to be relevant unless I'm complaining about things. Still very new to Pearl, as obvious. Matt showed you how to deploy a dev environment properly. I, yeah. So, who am I? I'm the latest apprentice at Shadowcat. Minion, also. That's also the only time you may see him in a suit, otherwise in the grave. Maybe alive. <laughs> so. I need to work on a server. Work using some mojo, so let's do some Perl coding. Let's set up a dev environment. On Windows, uh, no, mojo and strawberry Perl, they, they don't agree. So let's, let's not go with that. So we'll do a VM. We don't have VMware because money, so let's go VirtualBox. With Ubuntu, because that works and it's out the box. It's also slow as shit with even four gigs of RAM. I'm there searching and I'm waiting forever. So no, let's go with something else. Exabuntu, lightweight, goes quickly. Okay, this is better for me. Now I can do things. Let's check what Perl it's actually running. Okay, it's not the latest. So this is already where the ship is starting to slightly set on fire and reading online instructions maybe didn't go so well. Yeah. So. We get that. CPAN? Nah, nah, last decade. Let's go for some CPAN M. Uh, so let's go with that. Usual, you know, get all the depths. I also forgot the dashes. Pretend that isn't there. Um, sometimes you see this if you haven't got your config set up, like when you should set up a local lib. That's a good idea. I decided to go for the first thing it says to do there. Yeah. So, let's do that. Let's run it as root. Yes, uh, if you do not want your dev environment to be this grossly incandescent. It is now completely on fire, and things were breaking. Tom looks over my shoulder, goes, what? Mentions it in the uh, hash staff that we have. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it, yeah, it went... Uh, it's, it's okay, it's a VM. I didn't break the shit out computer. That would have been far worse. Okay, it's all good. So let's check things we're doing things correctly <laughs> and make sure there's an adult, which in this case was Tom next to me because I am not an adult in this scenario. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure there actually are adults in the office. But anyway. <laughs> So, after lots of swearing, going, what the fuck, and, oh, okay, we moved that there, that there, that, right, okay, that's all fine, okay, good. Right, it's fixed. We'll, we'll throw them some Pearl Brew, because nice and simple, it, it, get that out of the way. <laughs> no, I'm not getting off that easy. <laughs> yeah, let's set up a local lib properly. Uh, th yeah, okay, fine, fair enough. Luckily, Tom has done this enough with other dev places, to actually have already a script for this. Here it is in full. I've also done it, yeah. And yeah, it, <laughs> there is a moral to this. Sometimes instructions have to shoot your own foot. Also, before re you read instructions, consult an expert in reading instructions. <laughs> and to leave it off with, Thank you. Okay, so this talk was called AA, um, as in ah, uh, uh, not exactly. I guess, given the amount of time you've seen me with a beer, your first thought was probably Alcoholics Anonymous. And the only thing I'll say to that is that if you're going to be a functional alcoholic, you should focus on the functional, because it's an excellent style of programming. Um, however, so today, 
um, we're actually going to be talking about async programming and more specifically async awake. Now, happily, Paul Evans already showed you how to do it properly and sensibly, but since I do neither access code nor sanity, um, he needs Perl 524 in excess. I want 5.8 in pure Perl so I can fat pat things. So, how are we going to do this? Well, how does async await work? You need to save the lexical context. You need to save the location in the subroutine. You restore the lexical context. You return to the location in the subroutine. Cool. How do you save a lexical context? The pad list entry in Perl consists of a first array that's the names and then a set of arrays that's the values. If the subroutine because is in, you get more than one set of values. That's all cool. B.pm to the rescue. S3 ref 2 object, I can rip out the pad list, get the first entry, which is the names, pull the array out, and then pull the name out for the things that are actually lexical variables and keep a set of indexes. So at that point, in order to save the pad values, I grab the pad indices, I grab the pad that's on the top, as in um, dollar pad list of minus one, and then I pull them out by the indices and dump them into an array ref. That's the easy part. Set bad values, get the pad indices in the current pad, and then you jam them back in by basically shoving stuff as references straight back into the Perl internal data structures. I was pleasantly surprised this didn't seg fault. Um, so, okay, we've got that. How do we do suspend resume? Well, we use go to, obviously. Uh, because go to label will actually jump to the nearest go to on the stack, so you can jump out of subroutines with it. Lucas Mai wrote return multi level that does that. It's an excellent idea, honest. Um, and then you can use go to dollar expert to do a computed go to. Okay, futures complicate things slightly, so in the name of simplicity, because obviously this is going to be simple, let's do generators first. So using PPR again, same approach as yesterday, don't have time for that crack a second time. So you start off with the generator expression. You can see the yields in there. Uh, we've got a for each loop and whatever. Cool. So it rewrites itself to something like this. You've got gen resume, gen suspend, and gen sent. Um, so the setup is you wrap the sub with a gen yield label before you enter it, um, at which point gen suspend saves all of that stuff and does go to gen yield while silencing the warning as Pearl starts to cry. Um, then on next next, you local everything in. You call the sub again, gen resume, um, restores the lexical state with the code from above, and then does a computed go to up back out into the right point in the subroutine to resume it, and jumps to the label. So then, having jumped back to that label, gen sent gets called, um, which then returns the value that you pass the next. Now we have generator and yield working, excellent. Now, loops. Loops are always fun, Leonard happily already managed to implement his, um, I had mine a little bit earlier because mine is more crack fueled and less, and less sane. Because um, you take a loop like that and you rewrite it to that beautiful piece of code. I basically ripped the for each out and made the iterator explicit and used 3arg4. So now all of my state is in lexical variables, at which point the save and resume of lexicals gives me working for loops for free. I just have to identify the for each loops with PPR. That's fine. Um, so at that point, that's basically the entire thing for that, and you run that, and you get an output like that, and that totally works. So, okay, cool. Async and await. All you're really doing at this point is wrapping some future magic around what I already did. So, async sub and await uh, rewrites itself to that code. So, we've got the gen suspend, do the request, that returns the future. Slight extension to the suspend and resume code. My dollar f equals dollar self next, and we set up on ready to call back into ourself when, that, when the future we're awaiting completes. Gen sent. Um, just basically returns the value from the future or throws an exception if the future fails, uh, which point that code will produce this output quite happily. Async request to my homepage demonstrating that my, that my HTML is terrible. Um, tables are wonderful, I agree with Paul on that part. But it works, probably. My, my, my test cases work, that doesn't mean it works, right? Um, I have uploaded it to CPAN so you can all tell me how terrible I am. Async under sub is the equivalent of the future async await thing. Um, there's also an immediate invocation I'll do. I will compile async space sub to async underscore sub later. So you can use Leo Node's code normally and then swap in mine only if you have horrible deployment scenarios. Um, but yeah, try it, break it, complain at me. Um, happy hacking and it's on CPAN and GitHub already. Thank you. So, uh, this is Perl Anonymous, right? <laughs> uh, 
I won't be talking about CSV this time, uh, and I want to thank uh, all of you for making me having crazy thoughts. So, what was the most difficult thing for PPR that Damien had yesterday? Hair dogs. Hair dogs. So, this is a hair dog. It's a simple one. So, if you do, this is test zero. So it runs this and it works. Let's make it more complicated. If you put double quotes around it, it will interpolate the values. So it still works. You can use formats. still works. Mm -hmm. Did anyone know that you can use the variables inside braces? Well, that's so you can use multiple lines. Still works. That you can put code blocks in there. <laughs> so, there is a here doc inside the code inside the format. Will this work? Yeah, it does. Still simple, isn't it? Okay. So, two hair dogs. Will it work? Yeah, of course it does. Almost there. So, you can use double quotes inside the here doc, inside the format, <laughs> and it will use that foo over here. And will it work? Yeah, it does. No problem. Can anybody still understand and read the code? <laughs> so. How many people did know that this is possible? <laughs> We're not done yet. <laughs> so the third variable, so we can use a, a closing brace as a hair dog terminator, which will probably make PPR less happy because there's an ending brace and there's an ending brace, but we're still not there. And this is interpolated as the output of this array will be uh, used as a string to return to there and then print it over there. So, Right. Subformat. The top one is just a name collision, but who cares? We have glob, so it doesn't care. The format, the function returns a string. And here we use, just like here, the output of the format function to return the string and put it inside the last here doc. Would work. Yep, no problem. <laughs> so we've got a more complicated function which opens a new lexical file handle to a lexical scalar, then selects that scalar, selects a different format which returns the plain text, hello. We don't see that. <laughs> okay, yeah, I have a cursor, of course, I have a cursor. This format will just print hello into that scalar format. Then we, uh, we select std out again and return the format, which, which will be returned over here. And then used inside that here doc, inside the, uh, head the outer format, and then It still works. But PPI still parses this and returns the same document. PPR does not. It breaks. So, Damien. 
I'm, I mailed you the test file this morning. Did you have a fix?